Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the API First to the Extreme session. Uh, my name is Boris Verinov. I work for ADP Enterprise Data Architecture, leading the team that is responsible for API data governance. Many of you are probably familiar with the ADP as a company, <coughs> excuse me, because you're receiving paychecks with ADP logo on it. But ADP as a company, as a service, goes far beyond just products and payroll. It offers a broad variety of different products across many countries. In today's sessions, we're going to be talking about API journey, what we had to go, go through within ADP. Uh, we'll see how federated uh, approach is actually used to enforce, not enforce, but more encourage uh, API design first principle. And also the, about the API registry, which, is, which has become a centralized uh, repository of all API specifications. Just want to reemphasize that we're going to be talking about API specifications, designing API. It's not about routing, it's not about gateway, it's not about implementations. It's basically how API specifications driving the entire infrastructure. Um, as we used to say it, ADP data is our middle name. So naturally, the ADP strength is data. And here's just a few examples of the services that are covered, or areas that are covered by ADP services. Uh, before I started working for in, uh, enterprise architecture, I was a part of the ADP Innovation Labs, and that's actually where API journey has begun. One of my former colleagues who still works for Innovation Labs told me that once he was presenting at the conference, and he was asked, how can you put ADP and innovations into the same sentence? Well, <laughs> um, I have to tell you that for the past few years, ADP has been uh, transforming from a service company that uses technology into technology company that actually provides services. And I think we've been very successful on this journey. So as a technology company, ADP grew through acquisitions. It acquired different smaller companies with their products, very often with their own client base. And needless to say, those products had different platforms and technologies. And as a result, it became very difficult to integrate uh, across multiple products. So the answer to this was naturally APIs. So let's try to make sure that every product exposes APIs, so all the communication is done through the API. And at ADP, we're embracing the ADP first, ADP design first approach where specification comes before implementation. We already kind of mentioned earlier during the uh, general session that a a ADP, uh, API first design. So in ADP, we're trying to invest very heavily into this because we believe in the long, <laughs> uh, believe in the long run, it's gonna benefit. Although it does seem like a bit of a upfront uh, investment, but I think it benefits in the long run. Uh, APIs are mapped to business use cases rather than UI. Again, ADP consists of a variety of products. Uh, many products overlap their functionality. They may have slightly different data models, slightly different implementation. API should be universal. It shouldn't differ from one product to another. API is designed for backwards compatibility and reusability. In today's fast-changing uh, world, uh, we don't want to release a new version every three months. I mean, if we have to, we will, but we try to design so it has a, a long, at least relatively long life. They're self-descriptive and testable. And most importantly, the API specification is a contract, which, if, which is a fundamental principle of the API design first. Once the specification is uh, defined, both consumer development team and provider development team can work together simultaneously de developing the uh, creating the implementation of it. So when we engaged in these different products, as I said, different teams uh, started producing documentation. And needless to say, they chose, <laughs> as the platform, they chose their own formats. So documentation was all the way in totally different formats, including Word documents, cocktail napkins, emails, you name it. And at the initial result was not exactly as we expected. So the initial result was when, you know, some, some disconnect between uh, provider and consumer because specifications were not what they're expecting to. So the next step naturally would be, what do we need? We need API governance. And um, that's where, again, this is the next step in our journey where we started in, in, uh, investing into creating API governance. What are the basic principles of the governance that we adopted? 
Uh, we use the notion of canonical API when I say one capability, one API. We already had some early again, general, general sessions, reviews of capabilities. So in ADP, specifics of ADP is that we had, I said, multiple products. They may overlap functionality, so they may treat the same capability different. We want to make sure it's not the case. We adopted a single documentation platform, JSON schema to describe a payloads and open API specs to describe the specification. It's interesting, I've been to many conferences, uh, API related, and very rarely I hear about JSON schema as the payload. Because everybody's talking about URI, security, endpoints, routing, I mean, it's all great and useful stuff. But I think it's uh, in a heavily regulated and complex industry, and sorry, I apologize for the technical <laughs> difficulties, in a heavily regulated industry, this is very important to have a predictable payloads, and there is both on the request and response side. Because again, uh, you need to know what data to expect, what need, data needs to be submitted. So naturally, we are being relatively heavily regulated as the payroll and human resources company. So we are investing a lot into the definition of our payloads. Uh, we also use the event sourcing, meaning that every provider is uh, publishing events upon making any changes in their respective uh, system. So we can enable future audit trail, we can in, in uh, uh, data mining, uh, div uh, and uh, timeline continuum. Again, in today's modern UI design, timeline continuum is a very important aspect. Uh, here's a basic just diagram that represents the flow and it shows again the request is made, the provider would save the updates and the response and then publish notification. So the event manager which is the enterprise level service bus would also persist the event instance and the reason is be it's doing this to enable future data mining, inquiries, audit trails, as I said, everything that's related to the uh, history of any particular object and then would publish uh, and then it would send the event to the subscribers. We started initially with the centralized API design team. Uh, this centralized API design team would collect requirements, evaluate designs by different product teams, and again, as I said, ADP in nature is ma many different teams, overlapping sometimes, so we need to make sure that they all approve and stamp the design. We would define JSON schemas and define URIs, endpoints, headers, responses, and eventually publish maintain specifications. Started great for the past for the first few months. And then as the pace picked up, as you can guess, the centralized design team quickly became a bottleneck. Every team wants to have an API design, every team wants it yesterday, and there are only so many people who can help them. You no. Know? So team, the general frustration, you know, all this the whole nine yards. So the next thing was, uh, let's see how we can federate this. Let's see how we can remove a bottleneck. In today's day and age, it is a very popular approach in software development to have an open source or within the company inner sourcing, uh, where different teams contribute to the design and following certain guidelines and standards to make sure that the uh, design is again scalable uh, or software production is scalable and uh, there is no single bottleneck. And we decided to try to this approach towards the specification. Now let me remind you again, we're talking about specification at this point. We're not talking about any physical implementation of the API. One of the most important questions was how much guidance and how much governance we want to have. I mean, it's easy to govern, just you know, they're putting tight restrictions, but how successful would it be? I mean, if you, put, if you restrict everybody from using anything they want, they're probably going to find the ways to go over, to, to, to go over this, uh, this governance. And we've seen it before, I'll be honest. I mean, we have some, let's say, friction with different teams. <laughs> so here is a typical diagram actually that represents the different subject matter experts from different uh, functional domains who submit their uh, specifications in the centralized Git repository. And this would include Swagger document, open API specs, or I keep using Swagger, just the old habit. I know it's called open API specification now. So uh, JSON schema samples and other artifacts, including the uh, sequence diagrams, including object models, everything that can be helpful to understand their specification. 
Uh, important thing that I want to highlight is the sample requirement because uh, data is, you know, developers prefer to look at the samples to understand what the data should be coming. And uh, they don't want to interrogate anything else until they see the sample. I mean, the first thing developer wants to try it, hit the, where's the try button? That's the first question. And the second, okay, show me the sample, how it's going to look like. And so we ask asking providers to make sure to invest time in pr producing meaningful samples. Um, what are the responsibilities of the federated governance or perhaps guidance team were? Uh, we would maintain logical domain model, which is very important, again, and a very complex uh, domain. We're actually covering very, a lot of different businesses. I would develop a reusable JSON schema component library. I'm going to talk about this in a couple of slides. But as I said, we are heavily invested in JSON schema describing our payloads. Um, this goes for the past say five, six, year, six, seven years. And we believe that uh, describing would be very specific about what type of payload is expected and what type of request payload needs to be submitted is very important. Uh, there are some flexibility there, but being crystal clear about the expectations is, is essential. It would define specification templates, open API specs, documents, uh, would include the standard responses, standard headers, uh, standard parameters, also URI templates. So essentially, the development team would not start from scratch. They would use this template to begin building their specification. We would publish guidelines, procedures, and acceptance criteria. This is, I think, very important to make sure the expectations are set correctly so the teams know what needs to be done in order for their design to be accepted. Educate and guide product teams. Again, no matter how good your documentation is, not everybody always reads the documentation. So again, you need some live sessions, live lessons just to introduce how, how things should be done. We'd manage Git repositories uh, by reviewing pull requests and approving or rejecting them, and eventually publish the API specifications. Sounds simple so far. Mm, kind of. Uh, the API product team, what were we doing? They would clone the Git repository, which included the all APIs that were defined so far by different teams. We are not restricting from anybody viewing any APIs within the company, so it's all publicly available, I mean publicly inside the company. Uh, we, they would define JSON schemas and samples based on the guidelines and templates, define Swagger open API specs documents based on the temp templates, as I said, just replace the URI placeholders with their own values and the parameter names with their own names. Submit pull request to the main repository. Uh, that was a general flow, but let me talk a little bit about the component library, as we call it, reusable Lego blocks. Um, as I said, very heavily invested into JSON schema. JSON schema describes everything, and we figured it out that we want to ma make sure that the APIs have a consistent look and feel. Uh, again, historically, different companies were acquired by ADP, different philosophies, different methodologies. Uh, but we want to make sure that the, when the customer that consumes ADP APIs switches to one product to another, sometimes they don't, may not even know they're switching. Um, or they buy additional service, they don't have to go to the learning curve again, uh, learning new API philosophy. So we want to make sure that APIs uh, within the company have consistent look and feel. We have more than 500 components. This number keep, keeps growing, and they cover both primitive and coarse business. Uh, this living, uh, living and breathing uh, organism, it's maintained by inner sourcing pretty much the same way how specifications are maintained. So the different development teams can submit their proposals. They can review the API. I mean, uh, they can request additional uh, building blocks. They can make uh, request some changes, or they can comment on. And uh, this library is indexed and searchable, so the development teams can always look and see, OK, here is the component that I need. If I want to build the API that involves somebody's address, here's the address definition. I don't have to reinvent the wheel. An address, again, is relatively primitive type, but I'm, I mean, there are much more complicated structures. If you, again, just for illustration purposes, if you have a pile of Lego blocks, you can build a building wall out of it, or you can build the whole house. And that's what our APIs are. I'm not saying we're only using those blocks, because our teams obviously can add something to it, some li little elements that are not there, or they, they can request additional block. But that's the idea. Have a standard uh, 
reusable components that can be used to leverage or actually to achieve the same look and feel across different APIs. Um, this snippet of uh, JSON schema shows a relatively simple uh, structure of the basic person type that it has the properties that are relevant to a person object that can be used across multiple domains. And next, this slide shows actually extension. Do you see where it's using the base person as an extension? And it adds additional attributes. Let's say the human resources are require additional attributes in order to be able to comply with different regulations and also put some information to the system. So uh, it's a pure extensibility model where you can take this existing component as a base and extend it with additional attributes. Uh, this slide shows the specification template. Apologize, probably a little bit hard to read. Uh, but the idea is that this specification template, that's, it's fully loadable into Swagger Editor. We just show it for the illustration purposes into Swagger Editor. It can be, uh, the teams can develop their specifications using any tool of their choice. That's uh, one of the main principles we want to make sure we follow because it's a large company. It's about 60,000 people, a lot of different development teams and products. You can push the same development environment across. We have a variety of technologies, Java, .NET, uh, Node, everything. And so we can push the same tool. So we decided that as long as they produce specification uh, that is compatible with Swagger, we are fine with that. And we also introduced a lot of extensions to the Swagger and build our own, our own U Swagger UI that actually supports these extensions. A uh, couple of words about API specifications. Uh, we, to some extent, treat it as code, or actually making sure it is machine readable. Uh, it's, as a result, it's sent through the built-in packaging process. What does it built-in packaging mean in the sense of uh, API specification? Well, essentially, if you saw previously, there are a lot of references referencing standard types. So all these references are resolved, all this, we call it flattening process. So we flatten schemas, we flatten specifications. So the schema is single file, single downloadable file, as well as specification is single downloadable file. We purposely keep schemas and specifications separately, uh, for mainly for performance reasons, also for some downstream uh, integrations. They only require schemas. They don't care at all about the OS specification itself. They only need schemas, so we need to keep it separate. Uh, they deploy to multiple environments. Why would you deploy a specification to multiple environments? Well, simply because, again, we uh, make sure they're machine readable, so they're used by different infrastructure components, those like API gateway uh, and, and additional uh, enterprise service bus that needs the schemas to validate the payloads, as well as the public, a layer of public exposure API where we're actually exposing APIs to the marketplace uh, to monetize them and support external customers. So we, honestly, we're still debating to some extent whether it's a code or documentation. And I would say, in many cases, it's both. It is something that, uh, it is documentation as far as the development, as far as the API design team is concerned. And it is a code or machine readable as far as the different infrastructure components are concerned. I mentioned API registry and infrastructure. So what is that? We already saw this chart where it's actually this diagram where different subject matter experts or different teams submit the uh, design into centralized repository. But now imagine this is not in a vacuum. This is a part of the overall API registry where it is. It's actually feeding the API registry that includes the static content server, includes MongoDB with all the information. And also, most importantly, it exposes its own set of interfaces, its own set of system APIs, where different elements within the system, such as service bus, proxy, marketplace, permission store, can all access these uh, specifications and make uh, or build certain logic based on it. Uh, also, on the other side, there is a UI that different teams can browse. They can, it's actually, we call it hub or browser, API browser, um, where different teams can actually browse the repository, see what APIs are defined, what are the specifications, what are the schemas, what are the examples there, and the very often they realize they don't even need to build or define a new API because guess what? This API is already defined. It's a canonical API, so it addresses canonical capability. Therefore, they're saving a lot up front because they, they don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, here's the few statistics after we, 
uh, started a few months ago. And uh, as you can see, the red bar represents actually the uh, federated mode, while the blue bar represents the old style. And you can see the efficiency is much higher. And just uh, to wrap it up, I would like to kind of go over the top five points that we learned over our journey, or rather five lessons. Um, invest or embrace API design first. It really pays uh, when you do this first. And uh, although it does sound like a bit of an um, upfront investment, it really makes sense. Uh, collaborate and contribute to the API design. Uh, there is no single team that has enough expertise to build it within a large company. So you always solicit input from uh, other experts. Try to maintain or strive to maintain consistent API look and feel. We do it through the reusable component library and templates. The choice how you do this is yours, but it is very important to avoid learning curve for other, to, to avoid steep learning curve for the API consumers. Uh, as a governance body, try to guide rather than govern. Again, if teams contribute to the governance model, most likely they're going to adhere to it. If you just push governance down, it's questionable. And uh, again, use API specifications to drive the infrastructure, make sure they're machine readable. It's not just for the human consumption, but also for the infrastructure. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Here's my information, should you need to ask any questions. Thank you again.